some kiddo. Be invited into places like Tel Aviv. Great software. Seriously, that's all you got? Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready? Do we want to get into that? You can use DNA. Boy, those robots look cool performing. My name is Boris. You can reach me on email or Twitter or Skype or whatever. And I'm a founder of Astrails, an Israeli web consultancy company. We've been doing awesome web and mobile applications for quite a while using Rails and React. And some of you probably uh, recently started to hear that AI is taking over the world and revolutionize it and uh, threats and amazes and reassures and also becomes a mainstream. Uh, so let's clarify the, the terms. What are we talking about? So AI is an artificial intelligence, the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. And I especially highlighted this uh, part of the sentence. Uh, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and transition be and translations between languages. Machine learning is a type of artificial in intelligence that provides computers with an ability to learn without being explicitly explicitly programmed. Machine learning focuses on development of computer programs and blah 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 blah. So we are going to focus on without being explicitly programmed. And preparing the presentation, I was thinking that it might be a good idea to start with this slide. Uh, let's take have a look in this equation. It's the cost function of feed-forward neural, neural network. Uh, relax, I'm kidding, because this is the proper equation. Uh, <coughs> and we might get there soon. Meanwhile, there are two types of machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. The supervised learning is when we train the system uh, on the data which is labeled. I mean, we have the proper answers to, to our questions. And then obviously we take the data that we don't have a, an a proper answer for, use the trained algorithm and get the prediction. And unsupervised learning, when the training data is not uh, labeled, and we can come up with some not obvious outcome about correlation between the data we have. Uh, let's start with an algorithm called linear, uh, linear regression, uh, and we will learn most of the machine learning concepts using this uh, algorithm. I'm going to use some simplified version. Let's say we have a set of examples. Uh, each example is called, uh, it has a label and a feature. X is, X is a feature. Uh, for example, we're going to predict the size, uh, the price of the apartment according to its size. So the uh, size of the apartment would be feature X and price of the apartment probably would be a feature, uh, uh, label Y. We have M training examples, X, Y, X, I, uh, Y, I, and we are going to use this training set, uh, come up with some uh, function called H and some learning algorithm will do some magic, some magic and produce this function for us. And then we will take the new data, use the function that we just created, just you know, figure it out our, uh, its parameters and we will get the prediction using this function. The function, by the way, is called hypothesis. So let's start with the linear hypothesis. This is the red line is our linear hypothesis. The red dot is a new data. We never learned what's the value in this point, but using this hypothesis, we can just you know check what's the value of y there and say this is our prediction. The linear hypothesis looks like h equals to that, uh, theta zero plus theta one multiplied by x, the only feature we have. So our task is to find theta zero and theta, and theta one. Right, so once we have this function, we will be able to take the new da data, put into this function and get every results we want. Sometimes the uh, functions uh, or hypothesis looks a bit uh, more complex when we have more than one feature. For example, we can have a feature of like, you know, 
uh, size of the apartment in square meters, number of rooms, the age of the building, and some resulting price in shekels. For example, for 80 square meters apartments, three rooms, in the building uh, of 22 years old, it will cost in Tel Aviv probably 2.9 million shekels. And for our abroad friends, one USD is about 3.85 shekels. It's probably the most interesting uh, slide of this presentation. Uh, <coughs> to analyze how good our hypothesis is doing, what we actually need is some kind of measurement. So we're going to measure the errors that our algorithm produce, and we're going to summate these small lines there. Each line represents the error between the real data and the estimated uh, value. And the summation of these errors, or actually a bit more complex thing than summation, is called a cost function. It's a linear regression cost functions. It represents the square error function, uh, which is uh, more or less average distance between the real values and the predicted values. So we want our, uh, mathematically speaking, we want to minim minimize the error. So the less uh, the error, the better the algorithm we have, right? So when our algorithm produces no errors, we more or less have a practically best algorithm in the world. And one of the numeric approaches to finding a function, a function's minimum is called gradient descent. We're not going to learn how exactly it works, but let's un just understand that there is some magic happens here. So we have a data set, x1, y1, x2, y2, etc., up to m uh, examples. We pass them through some magic function called gradient descent, and it gives us the theta 0, theta 1, and such parameters of our uh, hypothesis. And then we are ready to predict. So we just put, you know, new data instead of x, multiply them uh, by theta 1, theta 2, blah, 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 and we get our prediction. Uh, it's important to scale features, by the way, before we do some kind of predictions, just to put the features somewhere uh, between 1 and 0. So instead of actually having the size in meters, we're going to, mul uh, to divide it by 110. So the features will be between 0 and 1. And another important thing is to do uh, called mean normalization. So that average value of the feature will be somewhere around 0. So this is how our features will look like after these two operations. We will uh, divide by 110 and uh, also do some another mass. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of matrix manipulations involved here because we can, you know, rewrite the function in the vectorized form. So instead of writing theta zero plus blah blah blah, we just take the vector theta transposed multiplied by a vector x. And we all know that GPUs are extremely effective at uh, matrix manipulations, and NVIDIA is extremely successful on selling an AI-enabled GPUs. You can pay attention to what's happening at the end of 2005 and at the beginning of 2006. This is where all the AI hype started, more or less, and NVIDIA is doing very well. So another uh, algorithm we're going to have a look at is called logistic regression, or sometimes it's called uh, classifier. So let's say we have two uh, kinds, two, you know, two different uh, objects here. Pay attention on the axis. It's x1, x2 right now. And we can tell that there are two groups of objects. Uh, examples of uh, classifier algorithms are fraud, not fraud, uh, spam, not spam, etc., etc., etc. We will apply a small change to our hypothesis. We will just pass it through something called logistic function. And the result of the logistic function will be the probability, estimated the pr probability that the y equals 1 for the input x. Okay? So uh, G is called logistic nonlinear function. There is quite a lot of them. This is the uh, chart of something called sigmoid function. Uh, there, are, there are others like, you know, hyperbolic tangent, uh, relus, etc. The 
whole algorithm is completely the same. We just take the examples, taking into account that y's are now zeros or ones, right? True or false. Pass them through some kind of uh, minimization of the, cost of the cost functions, and the result will give us vector theta. And then we take the new data, pass it through this function, and if the result is more than uh, 0.5, it's probably the true. If the result is less, it's probably the false. Uh, another algorithm is called one with all for uh, supervised learning. Let's assume we have an incoming email and we want to assign it to social promotions or updates tab, right? So we kind of have three different objects here, uh, three different groups of, of objects. And the trick we are going to do is that we are going to run three different classifiers, assuming only one type gives us y equals to one. So the blue lines are one, these two are uh, uh, zeros, like false. And then we take this group and compare with the rest. And then we take the, the third group and compare with the rest. And that will actually give us, you know, probability that like 60%, what was it? Uh, 60% uh, social, 70% promotions, and 90% updates. Most probably the email is related to the updates and Gmail will put it into the update stuff. They, do, they don't do it like that, but it's more or less uh, this, the more or less, you know, uh, similar algorithm. They usually use something else. I'm going to that right away. Uh, don't implement it at home. Uh, there are standard libraries like LibSVM and LibLinear that, and that many others that do all this uh, mathematic stuff, so you don't have to actually care about what is cost function and how to run gradi gradient descent on it. And now we're getting to uh, neural networks. So this is the perception artificial neuron. It gets an input, d does some kind of computation, and produces an output. A feed-forward neural network looks like that. It's a combination of different neurons, and each neuron feeds the neurons that are in the next uh, layer. Each, you know, row, uh, each column of neurons called the layer. The uh, first one is called input, where we put our data. There is a series of uh, layers in the middle, they called hidden layers, and the last one is the output layer. So if we will have a look at uh, the same example of estimating the real estate prices, we can think that we will have like three features, size in square meters, number of rooms and the age of the building. Uh, we will get four different estimates on the first hidden layer, and then we will use these estimates to have a final estimate. This is more or less how the neural network works. It also can be used for something called multi-class classifiers. In order to explain that, let's have a look at the log lo uh, logistic unit. So it takes the inputs, multiplies by weights that are one, theta two, theta three. It's actually zero, one, two, it doesn't matter. Uh, and we get some, res some result of summation that we put again into logistic function. The logistic function of the neuron is called activation function. And we already familiar with the activation fun uh, functions. Again, this is the sigmoid, but it could be hyperbolic tangent or rectified logistic units or anything else and then it produces an output. The output of the neural, of the logistic neural network is also probabilities of the classes. So for class Y equals to one, we have a probability 1.7. For the class Y equals two, we have a probability uh, 0.47. So most probably it's Y equals to one in this example, but there is a very good chance that this is also Y equals to two. A neural network without any hidden layers actually works exactly like uh, logistic regression and the one with all uh, approach to the logistic regression. So logistic regressions are usually much, much more simpler and easier to, to use in the mean that they're not that CPU and GPU uh, consuming the neural networks. Uh, cost function of the neural network, it was uh, more or less our first slide with a lot of summations there. 
sometimes called a loss function of a neural network. It's again the representation of an error uh, between a real and predicted value. And all we need to do again is to minimize this uh, minimize this cost function. So we're going to do completely the same thing. We're going to use the training set, we're going to pass it through some kind of learning algorithm and we're going to get uh, the theta values for every connection between every neuron. Uh, using the output of the neural network, uh, calculating the errors and propagating them back to the beginning and then doing this thing again in order to update the weights is called backprop or backward propagation of error. So if we're going to use the gradient descent we talked about, some kind of magic that finds the function minimum, plus uh, backpropagation, uh, it's actually deep learning. Again, it's training a neural network because the, the deep ne uh, th this concept was like since uh, probably 1950s, so I especially put the uh, quotes here because it's kind of, you know, just rebranding of the well-known approach of learning or training neural network. Deep because it has many layers, okay? This is you know, just new fancy buzzwords, uh, buzzwords as I see them. Uh, there are other kinds of uh, neural networks. One is called convolutional neural network. It's widely used for image recognition. I'm not going very deeply how exactly it works. I'm going to explain that, but you know, just if you're going to uh, use the slides to Google some things, I put this slide for the reference. And recurrent neural networks, it's basically when more or less every neuron uh, sometimes sends his outputs back to the next session of the calculations and they're widely used in neural language, uh, in natural language uh, processing. As you may imagine, the, all this uh, mass thing is very, very CPU and GPU expensive thing and like I told previously, you should probably, con uh, should probably consider logistic regression or support vector machines algorithms before jumping into training neural networks classifier. You might be familiar with this coding, uh, with this comic, my code is compiling, and some of you who are long enough with us to be familiar with this one from 2008, where the compiling is replaced by RSpec, right? Uh, Today, this comic might look like that because I'm doing the same because I'm training a neural network. Uh, let's go to the demo. Uh, the destination suggestion. So it's kind of Ruby conference, so I felt obliged to show some Ruby code. And uh, recently, Waze and Uber, with quite a lot of PR, published a new fa fancy thing like, you know, when you open the application, it will suggest a destination where you want to drive or where you want to take a taxi to. So I'm going to uh, implement this feature. I'm going to use Ruby Fast Neural Network for that. And here is the code. I'm going to use some neural network file, define my locations. The locations would be home, work, tennis, I mean, tennis courts just for short it's tennis, and parents. This is the most four most popular destinations I'm driving to. I'm going to have indexed locations and I mean that, that every symbol in the index locations will point to 0, 1, 2, 3, the index in the array. And then I'm going to train the network with the following data. Each line of the XX array represents one day. So at first week, at Sunday, it's, uh, we have a pointer here somewhere? Uh, never mind. Uh, the first, uh, I'm, I'm driving work at the first day of week at 8 uh, o'clock at the morning. And then I'm driving to tennis at the first day of the week at 5 p.m. at the morning, 17, right? And then at 8 p.m., I'm driving home, first day of the morning. Yeah, thank you, great. So this is what we're going to do. And then the, the, uh, the second day of the week, keep pointing, great. Uh, second day of the week, I'm just, you know, driving home straight from the work, and cetera, and cetera, and cetera. And uh, I have like, in the real code, I have like four or five weeks of training. 
it's usually not not we don't need such uh, you know such many data for this basic thing uh, but in the code I will I will show the link to the github repo uh, it actually does a few a few weeks of training then we are going to prepare our data set and scale the features so we will take the indexed location and convert them to wa 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, right? No texts, no messages, only the numbers and then we will uh, <coughs> scale the days by dividing by 7 and scale the time by dividing by 24 and then I'm going to take a neural network with two inputs, right, according to the number of features, 25 hidden units, uh, 25 layers in hidden, uh, 25 units in hidden layer, and four outputs according to the number of our uh, uh, labels, like home, uh, tennis, work, and uh, parents. The training network was uh, learned with 100% accuracy. It means that on the training set, when we take the, the, the weights and use the training data as an input, it will give us always uh, the proper result. So let's get back to this slide. So when I tried to test what I'm going to do at the first day at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, it returned me the work. This is mean the accuracy on the training set. Now let's play with it a little bit. Uh, we will test the first day, like, you know, 4.30 p.m. Then we will try the first day 5 p.m. And then we will try the first day 5.30 p.m. And then we will try like, you know, 12 minutes to 6 p.m. And let's see where this algorithm will uh, suggest us to drive. So the uh, white text is the results and the uh, syntax highlighted is a copy of the training data set. So uh, at 4.30 p.m. it thinks that we are going to play tennis with quite uh, quite high uh, confidence, like 97%. At 5 p.m. it thinks that we should go to play tennis, but probably go home with really, you know, 6% uh, probability. At 5.30 p.m. it thinks that it's time to go home or probably go to play tennis. It's slightly, you know, home is more attractive position for, for, for this trained set. And as we remember, because we usually I usually play go drive to play tennis at 5 p.m. 5:30 is exactly in the middle, so it's probably home, but maybe tennis. And obviously, if we are going to 6 p.m. Uh, to 6 p.m. Uh, or 12 minutes before the 6 p.m., the percentage of home uh, grows to 82 percent. So basically, I just you know checked the, the results and the results are pretty amazing. So this is exactly what I would expect from this kind of algorithm to suggest me the, the default road. And this is more or less what Waze do, by the way, and uh, Uber, I suppose. You can grab the code from uh, this place on the GitHub. It, it like, you know, three files or something like that. One is my wrapper around the standard uh, fast neural network and uh, another file is this training examples. But don't do it at home. Use something very much more powerful this than these implementations. I highly recommend you to check TensorFlow, uh, but you will, learn to ha you will have to learn Python. I mean, there are some kind of Ruby bindings there, uh, but I didn't try it with uh, Ruby bindings. The most interesting thing about TensorFlow that it allows to produce a model and play with this model on your laptop and say that once the model works well, you can upload it to the Google services and they have some kind of AI in the cloud. And when you pass the model, they will use highly GPU'd machines to make the learning very fast. And obviously <coughs> the uh, prediction then will be uh, easy as well. And now we are getting to an, to an unsupervised learning. I will briefly review the you know, most common algorithms we have there. Uh, how much time? How much time do we have, Ben? Five minutes. Great. Uh, so, first one, first of all, is clustering, right? So we are 
have non-labeled data, so just vectors of axes, some you know random parameters, and we are going to try to find some hidden correlations between the data. So we can, you know, figure out that this data is somehow clustered in this way. So the green, the, the red lines, the yellow lines, and the blue lines uh, will be, dots will be detected automatically by finding something called centers of the clusters or centroids. I'm not going to go very, you know, deeply into this, but this is widely used in market segmentation and uh, social networks connection analysis and such and such. It's very powerful, but very, very simple algorithm that you can implement in Ruby, by the way. Uh, anomaly detection is another unsupervised learning algorithm to detect anomalies, right? So if we have, for instance, uh, some kind of cluster or server monitoring software, and we draw on the access the network and CPU usage, we may find the pattern that the less CPU is spent, it's probably less network uh, traffic is generated or served, and this is, by the way, the most common pattern of all the servers, right? So these servers are doing nothing, and those servers are pretty busy. But these two are outliers, right? So this one burns CPU, and this one probably, you know, dumps our uh, database backup to, to, to NSA, it was very popular here. Uh, so something is wrong with these two. And the algorithm called, uh, uh, this algorithm actually allows us to find this very easy. It's again, very simple uh, algorithm with relatively simple mass. Uh, by the way, it's widely used for uh, anomaly detection uh, in production. Like we have, you know, some kind of, uh, some kind of real machines, not production servers, something that, you know, works and some mechanical parts. And then you can, you know, measure the temperature of the engine and the, for instance, and the, s then the sound or some kind of noise. And there is always more or less the same uh, hidden uh, correlation between them and we can easily find outliers. Uh, as I told, fraud detection, all kind of servers and cluster monitoring, etc. And one of the most powerful algorithms called collaborative filtering. Uh, we all know the most, you know, obvious use of it. If we have recommendation of different people for the different movies, then we can predict what the what the rating of the particular person for a movie would be. So, would John love Doctor Strange, or would the uh, author uh, like the arrival or not? Uh, this is very, you know popular algorithm that was uh, started to be implemented like 10 years ago and today everybody including Netflix, Apple and whatever use that but the not well known thing about it that what it allows, it allows automatic features and their weight detection. So we don't have that the movie or a song is for instance a, a sad song so the level of sadness of the song is 0.95 we just say uh, def uh, define me some 10 uh, 10 different features per each song or per each product and generate the weights for these features. We sometimes can't even name th these features, but they, they are there according to the user ratings. And also it allows to build a similarities between users and between the items. This is, by the way, how the suggested products work, right? So you go to some site, you buy some, some shit, and then at the end they say that people that buy this also bought that. So, and sometimes, and not even sometimes, and most of the times it's quite relevant products. So they use the distance between these items in some n-dimensional space. Doesn't matter how exactly it works. If you want, you can learn a bit more about that. But this is the algorithm who actually does this thing. So I obviously wasn't able to cover all these things that are related to machine learning. It's just, you know, points what to, go to, what to Google. But I hope that you have now more things to Google than you had, uh, than you have previously. Uh, slides will be available on astrales.com. Thank you very much.